Mm. Y'all, it has, who has just been having an incredible week? Let me hear you. If you've been having just like, man, I got to tell you, like, uh, my name's Adam, by the way. Some of you guys I've been able to get to know. A few of you have roasted me, which I appreciate the humility. It's been good. Let's just get the pick the corn thing out of the way. I've, I've heard all the jokes about Illinois. It's not pretty. We don't have mountains. But let me tell you, we got oxygen. We can breathe. It's cool. But hey, here, here's the thing. Um, I've been just watching you guys pursue Jesus this week. Um, just listening to the words that God has been giving people, watching people pray. Uh, as I've been kind of just standing watching this, here's the reality of where I'm at right now. I have like five sermons I want to preach because I'm excited. Um, you don't want that, trust me. Uh, my good friend always tells me you don't have that many good things to say, so make sure it's short. So we get, we're going to we're gonna have to really focus to get into this. But here's what I want to do. Um, I love to do this before I preach. And there's this um, illustration that helps me kind of prepare because um, I, do, I love preaching. And one of the reasons I love preaching is because I love the preparation um, that I get to put in. I love wrestling with God's word. I love thinking about how good God has been to us, and, and I love being able to talk to you guys. I like talking to people about, man, do you know how much Jesus loves you, but do you know um, that as you sit there, you have an active role. It's not a passive role, because you can be one of two things when you're out there. You can be like a rock, and it doesn't matter. Uh, we, we could tell you about how good Jesus is. We could tell you about the life that he has for you. But if you come in here and you think, I don't want this. I don't want to hear it. I'm not open to it. It's like pouring water on a rock. It's just going to roll right off. So you could also walk in here like a sponge. Um, and, and one of the verses I love most in Scripture that says, when you come after me with all your heart, you will find me. And you might not know the whole Bible. You might not even know where to start. But if you're like a sponge and you're like, God, tonight I am ready to meet with you. I'm ready to be with you. It's going to be like water pouring on a sponge. And I promise you because God promises you that he's going to meet you here. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray. And I don't want to just pray for you. I want to give you a chance to pray for yourself and to pray for the people around you that tonight, um, as we look at what God has for us, that I pray that everybody in this room would be like a sponge. So I'm going to just kind of lead you uh, in prayer, but just pray for yourself quietly. So I'm going to give you a couple things to pray about. Let's pray. God, thank you um, that you have been so good to us. And I pray right now that whatever distracts us, God, put the thing that we know is going to tempt us to distract us, whether it's a phone, whether it's the person next to us, whether it's something that's back home, whether it's a pain that you're carrying, God, I pray that we would remove these things. And God, tonight, I know like the spectrum of uh, just the feelings that we have in this room are all over the, are, they're all over the place. And I pray that you would break hearts of stone and that you would give us tender hearts to hear from you. I pray for, for myself as we're doing this, that these aren't just words that I'm saying, but these are words that we live by and that speak life into us. And God, tonight, my, my heart's cry is for people and for me to see you. And so God, give us eyes to see who you are. And when we see you, God, I know that there is nothing that can stand in the way of your glory. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. This week's been, is this been, this been like one of the best weeks, right? Best week of the year? It's good. Uh, Evan, night one, I love this illustration because this bell's been on the stage and it's a powerful symbol. And I just want to remind you, it's like in the 17th or 18th century, I'm not very good at school. You heard my whole thing about school. But anyway, a long time ago, people were getting real sick and they were dying and it's super contagious. So it's like as soon as they get this disease and they think you're dead, put them in a grave because we don't want this to spread. But the problem was they were putting people in a grave too quickly, right? So sometimes they weren't actually dead, even though it seemed like things were hopeless. And so what they would do is they would tie a bell that if they woke up in this grave and realized that they were dead, I'm still here. Somebody get me out. And here's what we've been saying, and this is just a beautiful illustration of the gospel, because you, um, wherever you're at in this room, we all have been in a grave. Some of us might still be in the grave, and, and as I was reading through the questions, I love the questions in the panel, by the way, you guys ask great questions, but there's some of us, the grave that you're sitting in, 
Um, it's a grave of depression. It's a grave that you believe that actually suicide is the best option for you. It's, it's the grave of thinking, I just need to feel something, so I'll cut myself. It's a, it's a grave of thinking, you know what? I, I, I am worthless. Nobody's ever wanted me. It's a grave of thinking that your self-image is ugly and that you're not a child of God. It, it's a grave of gossip. It, it, it's a grave that you have dug yourself and you find yourself in. But here's another side of the room I want to talk to because this was me. There's a lot of us in this room that don't actually think we're in a grave. Because our whole life, we've either been good at something, or we, we've been people that people have wanted to be around. And so you honestly, we, we, this is me, this was my story, we honestly believe that, you know what, the grave's not actually for me because I am good enough on my own. There's no, there's no challenge that I can't take on. There's nothing that I can't achieve. There's nothing in front of me that I can't take on. But here's the problem with that. There's one thing that every one of us in this room has, and here's our issue, and here's why we're all in a grave. All of us were created in the image of God, which means his imprint is on you. And all of us have sinned, and that relationship between us and God has been separated. So whether this world tells you, you know what, you have everything, you're, you're smart, you're beautiful, you're good at this, and you think, you know what, I, I can take everything in this world. Let me tell you something from somebody who's been down this road. You can take everything this world has to gain. You can chase after every record. You can let people praise your name forever, and you're going to find yourself in the same place that you find someone who's depressed, who's been broken, and we all find ourselves in a grave but Jesus. Jesus is the only way out of the grave. And for us in this room, if we've, we've seen people make this decision to say, you know what, I'm not dead. I might have put myself in this grave. I am sinful whether I feel like I'm broken or whether I feel like I've had this all together. The moment that you recognize that you don't have this outside of Jesus is the moment that you ring this bell and we recognize it. There's another uh, term that this bell has been used for and. Um, how many of you guys are like sports fanatics out there? Anybody in the room just loves sports? We were talking about it earlier. There's three things in life that make me cry. Jesus, it's true. I'm not really that emotional of a dude, but I love Jesus. He makes me cry. My family, because I just think, man, I can't believe that's my family. Third thing is losing. I hate losing. It just sucks. <laughs> it might not be on the same pedestal of Jesus' family, but we're working on it, okay? We're all work in progress. Um, but there's this term in boxing and it's called answer the bell. And here's what answer the bell means. You go to your corner after every round, and to start a round, there's a guy on the side, and they ring this bell. And when you're in this corner, that is your signal that it's time to answer the bell. And what answer the bell means is when you get out and you look across the room and you see that opponent in front of you, it's time to meet him in the middle and the war is on. There's been times in my life, like, that, that kind of stuff I just love. Like, I love a good fight. I love sports. I love competing. And that's just been a part of who I am. Can I tell you guys a little bit about my story? Be cool. Okay, so when I was in fifth grade, this is great parenting, by the way. There's this kid in my class, and he was, like, bullying everybody. He was, like, beating them up. He was, he was, like, throwing down girls. It was insane. So I'm sitting around a dinner table, and my dad, he's like, I'm telling him about this. I'm like, Dad, I don't know what to do. And he's, he's picking on all these people, and everybody's scared. And he goes, what? He's like, you need, to, you need to answer the bell, man. You need to go stand up with him. I'm like, I don't know, Dad. This dude's a lot bigger than me, a lot stronger than he looks at me. And he goes, son, if you don't stand up to him, you're grounded. I'm like, okay. All right. I guess, like, I'd rather get beat up by him than get beat up by you, so we're good. So, um, Anyway, there's like a time in my life I had to answer the bell. I remember I walked into school the next day. I'm like, hey, we're not standing this for anymore. I got slammed on my It's that part of the story we're not going to talk about. But um, it's time to answer the bell. There's another time my brother, he's four years older than me. Um, my parents gave us permission to go get milkshakes one day, which was a big deal. We were riding our bikes. It was about a mile and a half away. And we're riding. We get our milkshakes. And on our way back, you have to ride through a park. And I know you see my massive physique now. And my, don't laugh that hard. Um. <laughs> But I was getting a little tired. I'm on my little red huffy. I'm like, uh, uh, all right, Ryan, I'll catch you later, man. I'm just going to watch this basketball game for a second. Uh, there's, these, there's these dudes. They're like four or five years older than me. They're shooting. I'm on my little huffy, just rolled up, got the little training wheels in the back, all that. Um, ball rolls off, and it rolls up to my bike. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. I'll pick this up. I'm, I'm part of the game. I throw him the ball back. And then this real nice guy picks up the ball, and he looks at me, and he chucks it at my bike. And he says, hey, you little friend. Uh, <laughs> 
I, you already put me on live once. You can't be doing that. Uh, okay. Uh, I got to make a couple adjustments. Uh, give me the ball back. He was like, man, I'm, I'm about to answer the bell. I don't care if you're four or five years older than me. I pick up that ball. I look at him. I look at the ball. I look at him. And I throw this thing up. And all 66 pounds of me punts that thing the other way like 100 yards. I get on my little red huffy. I'm like, uh, uh, we're getting out of here. We're getting out of here. We answer the bell. It's time to run now. Round's over. And uh, the next part's a little blurry because this guy grabs my handlebars. And he picks me off the ground. And then his friend, this is a true story. He comes over and just, bam, scissor kicks me off the bike, and they beat me up real bad. Sometimes answering the bell puts you in a position when you realize when you come out of that corner that you actually can't defeat what's in front of you. All right, here's a real spiritual moment, okay? We all have been called to answer the bell. The first bell we have to answer is the bell to recognize that we need Jesus. But there's another bell that we're going to recognize that God calls us to all different kinds of things to do. And when we step out of that corner, there's a moment in our life, like when I was on my red huffy pulling the the wheelie right before I got drop kicked, where I realized something's got to change because I can't answer this bell by myself. It's like a game-changing moment. My coach in college Um, before every soccer game, he would say, there's a few game-changing moments in every game that if you are on the right side of them, you will win the game. Be the team that scores in the last five minutes of a half. And I love that. And I was looking back at my life and thinking, what are some game-changing moments that I've had? And one of them is when my friend introduced me to Chipotle. It's like double steak burritos, double chicken. This one I was on my parents' bank account. It was sweet. Enjoy it. Okay, and it was like every Monday it was Chipotle Monday. It was a game changer. Another game changer in my, my life is when I saw my wife. All right, ready? It was like, uh, who knows? Who, Chris Brown, you guys still listen to him? He's too old. Okay, anyway, it's like, excuse me, miss. I seen you from across the room. So I walk into this college small group. I'm like, hey, I'm at, that's actually not how it happened. Um, <laughs> I walk up, um, 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 uh, uh, I, uh, you're really pretty, and you talk about Jesus, I'm in, let's do this thing. Uh, but, so I meet my wife, and, uh, well, she didn't know it yet, but I was working on it, so I see her, and so I do what every good millennial does, I get on Facebook, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta do something here, I gotta figure this out, and she reads this book, and you guys know my history with school, we're working on it. I'm like, you know what? This is my end. So this is the work of Jesus in my life. I read a book in three days. Testify, Pastor, come on. And uh, I read this book. Next week at small group, I walk up, and I'm like, hey, I just read this book. Have you ever heard of it? And she's like, this must be the Lord's will. And I'm like, I'm thinking so too. Let's get married before you figure this out. And, and so it was a game-changing moment. Like my family started and, and we got married real young. Some of you guys were like, how old are you, 19? It's like, hey, don't worry about it. Baby face comes back in, a, in 10 years or something. And so we meet my wife and he, here's another game changer in our life. We get married. We got married in college. We moved back to our hometown in Illinois. Corn, we get it. Um, when we get back, I, I start working at a church, and she's working in a school, and there's this kid named Miles, and Miles, we talked yesterday about the armor, you know what I mean, like, that he was able to make everybody smile. He made everybody else laugh, everybody else liked him, um, but my wife started to notice he stopped showing up to school, and when he would come, he was the kid that used to make kids smile, but now he was the kid that was kind of just quiet in the corner. So she's like, Miles, what's going on? And he begins to tell her, like, his mom's really sick. Miles grew up, he didn't have a father, and so my wife, who is just the most incredible person I know, she goes, you know what, like my husband's a pastor, can we come and pray for you? So she calls me and she's like, hey, let's, let's go to the hospital, let's pray for Miles. So Miles and I, we meet on the top of a parking garage, and I'm like, Miles, what did you think when you first met me? And he said, I thought you were a stuck-up white boy. It's like, all right, cool. Uh, we can only go forward from here. So we walk into this hospital room. And we begin to pray with his mom. We're talking with his family. And in that moment, a doctor walks through the door. And when this doctor walks through the door, the doctor comes in, and she's kind of got her eyes at the ground, and she says, hey, I have really bad news. Uh, The cancer has gotten too aggressive, and you only have two days to live. 
and we were praying in this room, and I was sitting down, I was praying, I'm trying to think of the words to say, and one of the most bold moments I've ever been a part of in my life, Miles' mom, who had, who had come to know Jesus late in her life, looks right at her son. She says, listen, the doctor may think that he has the final word on my life, but I have met a God who has the final. I remember those words because when she passed, my wife and I, we were trying to figure out how to help Miles. So Miles comes in, and we're like, hey, well, let's try to get you hooked up with a family. And my wife hears this call to say, you know what, maybe we should bring him into our family. Now, understand we've been married about six months. We were 21. We didn't know up from down. We didn't know how to, like, do anything in our life. Like, money was tight. We had just bought a house. And I'm like, all right, babe, I'm going to pray about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, Dear Lord, I don't think this will work, so help us do something else. And my wife's like, no, I think God's calling us to take him in to our family. Two weeks later, I remember sitting in a Walmart, and there's, there's been just a handful of times where I was like, God, clearly, outside of Scripture, you know, it was like a clear call. It's like, God, you need to do this, Adam. And Miles joined our family, and I have to tell you something. When Miles joined our family, it changed everything. It was one of the best and most beautiful things I have ever been a part of. And that same kid who was in a hospital room watching his mom boldly proclaim about the Jesus who has the final word, I remember when he sat in a baptistry and gave his life to Christ, and he was never the same because this changes everything. And I have one more thing. I have to say this. This isn't like, this is off the topic of the message, but I want you to know something. When Miles joined our family, I know there's a lot of you in this room that that have been adopted or you've been a part of foster care, and there's this thought that Satan puts into your head that am I really the same? Do they really love me the same? And I have to tell you, I love Miles more than anyone else in this world, man. He is somebody who is a part of my family because you know what the strongest blood is? It's the blood of Jesus and nothing can separate that. So I want you to know that. It's a game-changing moment. The next game-changing moment was at 5 a.m., which I appreciate. or, or I don't really think that should happen too often. I'm sleeping and my wife, who's normally pretty sweet, um, she comes up and she's like... I'm like, yes, 5 a.m., what's up, girl? She's got this little thing. She goes, hey, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, oh, awesome. In an hour, let's celebrate. (laughs) Like, this is going to be great. And I have a little girl, and her name's Brinley, and she's part of my family. Man, it has changed my perspective on so many things. See, God has changed something within me because he has brought me a family who I love. I love them. But here's what I want to talk about tonight. We talked about this idea of answering the bell. And there's a moment in our life when we have to answer the bell where we recognize that unless something changes, we are not going to be able to overcome what is in front of us. But there is good news. I want to read this scripture for you. It's in 2 Corinthians. And here's what it says. It's on the screen. It says, Therefore, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed and the new has come. And here's what I want us to know. See, we have been called to answer the bell. God has called us into ministry. Whether you're a pastor or whether you're a high school student, there's things that he has called us to do to be a part of his kingdom because we have been invited into his family. And what we were once powerless to do because of our sin, we have now been given the power because Christ has made us new. And here's what I want you guys to understand. If you're still in this room and you think, I don't think I can overcome this. I'm not sure if I'm ready to ring this bell. I'm not sure if Jesus really can do this. Here's what I want you to understand. When you see the value of who Jesus is, nothing that is in front of you could ever stop you because of who he is. It's like this. Okay, you ready? $5 bill. We have a value that we assess for this $5, right? Like you probably wouldn't spend five bucks for a gallon of gasoline. How many of you guys, you wouldn't wouldn't do it, right? Okay, for five bucks, would you buy a double cheeseburger, milkshake, and fries? How many of you guys, like that's that's worth your value? Okay, all right, testify. How many of you guys, for five bucks, if I said you get an A on your hardest final straight up for five bucks, you, you do it? All right, here's the thing. For five dollars, for five dollars, if I said, you know what? For $5, just throw it on the ground and leave it because it doesn't mean anything. How many of you guys would just throw five bucks on the ground because it means nothing? No, no, okay. Hey, come here. You got five bucks? Come on. 
all you guys raise your hand, throw it on the stage. Um, we have a value for $5, right? It means something. It means it's worth this, it's not worth this. If I said for five bucks, you get to pick your dream car, how quickly would this leave your hand? It'd be like, <laughs> right? Five bucks. So here's the thing. This call to follow Jesus, this call to follow Jesus is a new life. And what a new life means is mean what used to be has to go. And so here's a real question I want you guys to wrestle with because all of us have things that we have buried ourselves in and I'm not sure we actually want to give them up. Like, I'm not sure I want to give up being the man. I'm not sure I don't want to give up making sure everybody praises my name because it feels pretty good. I'm not sure, like, I'm ready to open up my armor and, and get rid of this thing that, that has been holding me. I'm not sure I want to stop gossiping. I'm not sure I want to really follow Jesus. But here's what I want you to know. When you see Jesus for who he truly is, the creator of the universe, the one whose voice has power to create galaxies, who put the, the every detail in this earth, the highest of a mountain and the lowest of the sea, who knows the numbers on your head, who knows your every thought, who uniquely created who you are, who is that good, who has hundreds of thousands of angels that when they look at them, all they can shout out is holy, holy, holy. When you look at that, Jesus, it's like five dollars for a Lamborghini, man. Nothing should stand in the way. It's a game-changing moment, and now it's time to answer the bell. See, one thing I hate, one thing I hate in this world is that when I say family, for a lot of us in this room, when I say family, you think of the dad who left. When I say family, you think of the game that you were playing in when you looked into the stands and nobody was looking back. When I say family, you think when I was sitting on a bed and needing so desperately somebody to talk to and nobody ever walked into my room. When I say family, you think abandonment, you think pain, you think I don't want any part of this. But here's what I want you to know about the blood of Jesus. It doesn't just change me, it changes family. See, from the very beginning, God created us to be in family. And here's what family was from the very beginning, that God created us to be in perfect unity with him, which means he was with us. We were walking hand in hand with him. And even with this, after his creation, he created Eve, and this family was created, and there was no insecurity, there was no pain, there was only encouragement, there was only beauty, until one moment, sin entered into the world, because instead of walking into this family that God had created for us, we walked into our own ideas, and that fractured what God had created. It broke it. So now this family that we had with God, was we are now separated from God, and this relationship that used to be perfect with each other, it was also broken. But God is so good that even though we walked away from him, he decided, you know what, I'm coming to get my family back. And so he begins, the story of scripture is the story of God gathering his family and what was once broken has now been victorious in Jesus and he will come back. But here's how the story gets going. After sin enters the world, this is where insecurity comes from. When you ask, God, why do you let this happen? The, th the reason that sin and brokenness and the things that you hate are in this world is because sin is in this world and Jesus came to deal with that sin and we have that hope. And so in the beginning, after sin comes, he chooses his man, name, Man, oh, oh, man named Abraham. And Abraham trusted God because God promised, hey, listen, through you, I'm going to create a family. I'm going to create a nation through you, and, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. And Abraham trusted God, and so God began to move this story forward of how he was going to gather his family back. And then Abraham has all of these sons, and, and, and some of these sons follow God and are walking close to them, and sometimes they don't. And, and because of the choices they made, they find themselves in slavery, and then they cry out to who God is, and, and God, still desiring his family, frees them from slavery, and they walk away from slavery and they find themselves in a desert and when they're in the desert they begin to cry out like God why, why are you bringing us through this why is this so difficult and God's thinking don't you know I want to be your father don't you know I want you to be my son don't you know I want you to be my daughter and even in our grumbling even in our mistakes God continues to pursue his family and so they choose kings they don't want God as their leader anymore and some of these kings were good and some of them were bad but even one of the best kings David who had a heart after God 
God himself still fell short, but God still had a plan for his family because then he began to choose these prophets who said, and they were speaking the word of God, just wait, I'm going to send one who is greater. What David was unable to accomplish, I'm going to send one who is able to accomplish it. And these prophets were speaking of Jesus. When Jesus was born into this world, here's what Jesus means, God with us, that he was coming for his family. And when Jesus came for his family, he not only came to save his family, but he, under, he came to understand his family because Jesus, he knows what it's like to be the most popular person in the room. He knows what it's like for people to scream praises about who he is. He also knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be backstabbed. He understands your pain. Everything that we have been through in this world, our God has been through because Jesus came for his family and he was rejected and he was praised. And at the end of his life, the difference between us and him is that the end of his life he was perfect he never walked out of relationship with his father he still had his perfect connection with his heavenly father and his family and even though there was brokenness around him he loved all of us he loved people like no one else ever will and then at the end of his life here's what happened to Jesus he hangs on a cross and on the cross he experienced physical pain that is excruciating but he also experienced something far worse because everything that put us in that grave was put on Jesus pornography Jesus became on the cross gossip Jesus became on the cross lying Jesus came on the cross. Disrespecting your parents, Jesus came on the cross. The thing that you hate to talk about and you don't want to admit it to anybody, Jesus became on the cross. And Jesus, even though he had perfect unity, perfect family connection with the Father, in a moment he knew what it was like to be buried in a grave, crushed by the weight of our sin, even though he was perfect. Why? Because when Jesus came out of that grave by the power of God, he invites his family to join him back. And because even though we were once, we were once unable to be in perfect conformity and unity with the Father because of our sin, Jesus says, you know what? I will take your sin, I will take your shame, I will take your worst moment, and what I want you to do is I want you to put on my identity. I want you to put on my righteousness, and now when my Father in heaven looks at you, he doesn't see your worst mistake, he doesn't see your sin, he sees the perfect blood of Jesus, and that changes our family. Some of us in this room, I want you to know that the reason we can ring this bell is because Jesus became what we were powerless to do. He became our sin, and when he rose from this grave, he gave a new life. And now the corner that we walk out of, what we, what that, that problem in front of us, this sin, this brokenness, what you're going to walk back into once you leave this camp, you were no match for it. You had no ability to work your way out of your sin. I have no ability to defeat the things that are broken within me, but I have a God who has already done it, and that spirit now lives inside of me. And now when I'm ready to answer the bell. I'm ready to answer the bell, and here's what I want you to know. We still live in a broken world. But there's going to be a moment when Jesus comes back. And here's his promise, that he is going to restore his family to his original intention. There's going to be a moment when the clouds open up and Jesus comes back. And he will gather up his sons. He will gather up his daughters. And here's the thing. That will be the moment that there's no tears, that there's no pain, that there's no insecurity, that there's no brokenness, that there's no more graves, that there's no more evil. It's only the family connection with our Father and with each other. And I can't wait. But what do we do, family, what do we do while we wait? Because the bell that you have to answer is a bell of a broken world. The bell in the corner that you have to walk out of is not the world yet when Jesus comes back. How do we answer the bell? There's a scripture in Luke chapter 12. It's one of my favorite scriptures it's a parable that talks about what do we do how do we wait well as God's family and it says be dressed and ready for service keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return for the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks they can immediately open the door for him 
when I get home, my little two-year-old daughter, one of my favorite things is she presses her face up to the window when she hears the garage door open. And she is ready for her dad to come home. And I'm going to tell you right now, as a father, when my, when my little kid is ready for me to walk through the door, there is nothing that brings me more joy. And here's what I want you to know, that we are in a world that is broken, but there are bells that need answered. And how do we wait well for Jesus? We have our face pressed against that window, and the things that are in front of us, we tackle them now. We love each other because in God's family, we show mercy to each other. In God's family, we show grace to each other. In God's family, when one of us wanders off, we go after them. In God's family, there's no more people sitting by themselves. In God's family, we go after those who are insecure, who are broken, and we put our arms around them. In God's family, everything changes because we are the family of God, and we are ready to answer the bell. And even though you might have been in a grave, you got a Jesus that came out of that grave, and he lives in inside of you and I know I know that some of you you are hating the moment that you're going to walk and you're going to leave this camp and you're walking into a broken family you're walking into a broken relationship you're walking into a broken world but we are a people who are going to put our face against the door and when that bell is ready we're going to answer it because I believe this I believe that by ourselves we have nothing, but in Christ we have everything, and we are family, and when we go back into Colorado Springs, there's not going to be a school that's the same, there's not going to be a family that's going to be the same, there's going to be a relationship that's not the same, there are going to be people in this room that were once ignored that now have friends, and everything will change because he changes us, and he changes the enemy, and now he made us family. Yo. The bell's been rung. The bell's been rung. And before we step into worship right now, uh, there's another bell that's about to ring. And I want you to be transparent in this moment. We're going to be family. This is a family right now. We're not a different school. We're not seventh graders and seniors. This is a family. And we're going to best celebrate as a family out back. But here's what I want to do. Before we jump into worship, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions first question is this in transparency in honesty in faith in courage if this weekend you have given your life to Jesus if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior for the very first time not a rededication but for the very first time you have given your life to Jesus can you just stand up right now can you just stand up let's go let's go Come on, come on, in faith, in courage. Hey, we got some in the back too, don't miss them in the back. Come on, we're family, can you just come around those people real quick, come around them real quick, extend hands. Come on, be safe though, don't fall down no steps, be safe. Let's pray for these people right now. God, we welcome them home. God, you created every single one of these individuals. You created every single one of these people. And you have a plan and a purpose for your life. And we may have walked away. We may have had things that have happened in our life that have made this seem like it was impossible. Like we could do it on our own, but now we're starting to recognize we can. And in this moment, we have said, Jesus, you are Lord. I will do whatever it takes to follow you. If I'm yours, I'm in. But God, we know that this is, this is what the enemy hates. And the enemy wants to stop this. He wants to destroy this moment. But we, we will not let it happen. This family will not let it happen. God, we lift up these people. We thank you for children coming home, sons and daughters accepting the blood of Jesus. And now we are family for all eternity. Everyone said... Amen. Come on, come on. Let's have a seat real quick. Let's have a seat real quick. I got some more things to ask. This next thing. We have a lot of people in this room that you have had a deep personal relationship with Jesus. There's a lot of people in this room 
that you've been here before, you've done this before, you've gone back on fire, but then something happens. A relationship ends. Like Adam said, a family member walks away, a family member dies. We get caught up in peer pressure. We get caught up in friend groups and we get caught up in school and identities that we feel like we need to accept and pursue. And all of a sudden we've looked back and realized this is not who I've been called to be. I have not been living a life that is honoring Jesus. I'm not living a life that is pointing people towards an eternal kingdom. But you know what? This weekend, I'm answering the bell again. I'm allowing Jesus to pull me out of the grave again and again and again. If you have decided this weekend that you're going to rededicate your life to Jesus, can you stand up right now? Come on. Come on. Hey. Come on. All right, family, get them. Get them, family. Get them. God, we lift this pe- these people up to you. God, we know that it's not your intention to be standing again and again, but we know that it is your heart that will pull us out of the grave again and again. Some of these people are in the grave that they've been in for years and they keep crawling back to it and they don't know why, but here they are again asking you, God, please pull me out again. And faithfully, you have pulled them out. Faithfully, they have experienced you. They have praised you. They have worshipped you. And this weekend, they have said, no longer. No longer, God, am I going to be this person I became over this past year, two years, three years, however long it's been. God, I'm back in the family. God, I pray a hedge of protection over their life right now. I pray for these friend groups that are going to hold each other accountable. I pray for these friend groups, this family, they're going to point us out when we've started straying and walking away again. I pray for a community of faith that is going to surround these people with strength and with favor in the name that you have given us to put over all other names that are going to distract us. And God, I pray that this time next year we will not be standing here again. I pray that this time next year, we will have people on either side of us that are giving their life to Jesus for the first time because we have stayed faithful over this year and you have done miraculous, amazing things. Come on, God, we lift these people up in your name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Okay, come on. I got one more. Come on, I got one more. Hey, if you have felt this weekend that God has spoken clearly, audibly in your heart and your life, whoo! We ain't done yet. If you have felt that God has spoken clearly and audibly in your life and your heart this weekend, that you are called the full time ministry. You may have had a plan, I'm going to go be a doctor, I'm going to go be a teacher, I'm going to go do this, but now God is changing things and you're feeling worship ministry, student ministry, leading a church, planting a church, and you're called to full-time ministry. Can you stand up right now? Whoa! Wow. Wow. Come on. Come on, God. These people have answered the call. Come on, God. These people have heard your voice. They have felt your spirit. 
Come on, God, your church is the most beautiful thing that you have given this universe, and we need people to lead it. We need another generation to rise up to show us what it means to follow Jesus. We need a generation to rise up to show us what it means to live faithfully and live in purity and to live in holiness. We need a generation to rise up to speak the gospel, to live the gospel, to describe the gospel, to explain the gospel, to show us what it means to know that there is a Jesus that left his throne in heaven that came for every single one of us God we need people to lead your people these students right now have answered the bell these students right now have answered the bell they have stepped into a world that is going to change everything we have students that have stepped into a world that one day they're going to be standing on the stage preaching in front of thousands, declaring your name because you have appointed them, you have blessed them. We have students in this room that are going to sit in a room with two kids. They're going to change their lives. We have students in this room that are going to lead worship. God, I'm prophetically speaking over these students that they are going to do things that will change this world. Come on. God, we love you. We praise you. It is in your holy and precious and amazing and powerful name that we pray. And everyone said...